Remorse is memory awake. Her company's astir, a presence of departed acts, at window and at door. Its past set down before the soul, and lighted with a match, perusal to facilitate of its condensed dispatch. Remorse is cureless, the disease not even God can heal, for tis his institution, the complement of hell. These are the words of Emily Dickinson's poem, Remorse, and how fitting it is, then, that they should come to mind whilst in the discussion of the 2002 artistic expressionist anime that is Yoshitoshi Abe's Haibane Renmei. Indeed, Haibane Renmei is in itself an expression of the deepest and most sensitive of human feelings, a bittersweet love letter to the notion that sometimes God cannot forgive you until you have forgiven yourself, a line taken directly from the series trailer. Today, I propose a further discussion of the idea that Renmei is about more than fallen angels or charcoal feathers. Rather, it is a piece of artwork, one that communicates its tragic and lonely story through its themes and visuals, and seeks to accomplish much the same task as Dickinson's poem, to emphasize and place heartfelt importance on the feelings of remorse. Specifically, this is a video about guilt, and how Yoshitoshi Abe has used Haibane Renmei to explore it in stride. I'm Okto, and today in my corner, we uncover the dirt beneath these charcoal wings. Welcome aboard. Haibane Renmei was not the first anime created by renowned illustrator Yoshitoshi Abe. That honor goes to the critically acclaimed psychological deconstruction and masterwork that is Serial Experiments Lane, but there's an argument to be made on the basis that Haibane was the work that most clearly represents the unimpaired vision of its creator. Despite having already gained popularity with his work on Lane, Abe chose to write Haibane Renmei as a doujinshi, or self-published comic book. Abe has gone on record to state that his reason for doing this was so that he could allow the story of Haibane Renmei to take on the shape that it wanted to take, that with serialization there would also be restrictions on page limits and what Abe was allowed to do or express not only in the story content, but also in the character design and set pieces, and that he was afraid those things would impose an essence of artificiality to the work, something that he felt could ultimately taint or destroy the narrative. To further accent this, Abe chose to make a concerted effort not to plan ahead with Haibane, instead allowing the story to materialize as he crafted it. The process of creating Haibane Renmei was one that favored creative freedom and lack of expectation for an ending or plotline, so that its creator could express his innermost thoughts, weaknesses, and feelings, something that Abe clearly envisioned for Haibane Renmei given that he chose to self-publish it on his own time and with his own resources. Rather than create Haibane with the expectations of a fan base, Abe created Haibane Renmei with only the goal of unleashing a story that was somewhere locked within his subconscious, as though he were capturing a dream and placing it under a microscope for examination. The results of this kind of work are apparent all throughout the series, with Haibane Renmei's anime carrying over many of the unanswered questions left over from the doujinshi. One could make a solid argument that watching Haibane Renmei is the anime equivalent to looking at a painting of a maze or a labyrinth, with doors that lead to nowhere and hallways that bend around each other, only occasionally getting the feeling that you'll be rewarded for making sense of its world and the rules that govern it. But there's also an argument to be made that its world and characters only truly serve as a conduit through which to examine a much bigger picture. A complex, grief-stricken narrative that places emphasis not on the actual events and what they mean for the world of Haibane Renmei, but instead about how these characters each experience those events and then how they choose to respond to them. From the get-go, Haibane Renmei is written and directed in a way that places emphasis on the thoughts and emotions of its characters rather than its surroundings, which is good, because despite the world being slowly and gradually developed along with its characters, it never does so more than the absolute bare minimum in order to explain itself. And making the audience feel comfortable with that style of storytelling is important in ensuring that the underlying themes remain properly conveyed. For example, the first sequence in the series is of a girl finding herself in a less than average position, but rather than asking where she is or what's happening, the first lines of dialogue are instead used to tell us how this character feels. Lines like, I feel cold, or I feel like I'm falling, are used as a means to express to us the way the world works through the eyes and, more importantly, the feelings and emotional experiences of those who dwell within it. It's only later that we come to a concrete understanding of how this character feels and where she is emotionally that Abe finally allows the question of where we are to be asked. By placing the character's emotions at the forefront like this, Abe is implying that this is the way the rest of the show's conflicts and uncertainties will be resolved, first emotionally, and second, if there's time, intellectually. 
In reality, the majority of the imagery and set pieces in Hibane are metaphorical. They exist as pieces of an exploration of the concept of sin, and a deconstruction of the views of sin as defined by religion. But seeing Hibane as simply that is to walk only knee-deep in a pool of water which, in fact, goes far deeper. A pool which pierces a hole into the human psyche, and places before us a commentary on mistakes, regret, and moving on. And so, we dive deeper into a narrative that is all its own. Before diving into the two characters around whom the story revolves, and how they carry the thesis point of the series as a whole, I'd first like to go into an explanation and point of reference on the importance of metaphorical imagery in Hibane Renme. When Reki discovers the cocoon, it isn't treated as a foreign or unknown object. For a few moments, she's caught off guard by it, but it's very clear, despite her initial uncertainty, that she isn't unfamiliar with its form. As she gathers the other Hibane to prepare for the hatching of the new addition to Old Home, we get a few good looks at the cocoon. Unlike the rest of the color palette throughout the entire series, the cocoon has a bright hue, almost a glow, something nothing else carries in quite the same way. For a direct comparison, look at the shade of the cocoon relative to the color of Reki's wings, or any of the Hibane's wings for that matter. Even compared to Reki's eyes, which should be the brightest white used in a given scene, the cocoon is brighter. It creates a stark contrast to the rest of the room, which labels it as an important object, which is central to the overall plot, but also as the most innocent point in a Hibane's life, something that is reflected by the brightness and intensity of the color white, a color which historically has been used to represent purity in visual, and one which is only ever used elsewhere when it's being tainted or blemished in some way. See the examination of Reki's wings from earlier. It's especially fitting that Reki should make this discovery because at the core of the series' thesis is regret. More specifically, how Reki and Raka differ in their approaches to it, something I plan to discuss further in a moment, but before I get too ahead of myself, let's discuss some other examples of metaphorical imagery in the series. One example is Raka's experience attempting to escape the cocoon from the inside. Inside the cocoon, Raka lives in a state of ignorance. Though in a dream, she longs for the outside, choosing to allow herself to fall from the grip of the crow, the crow being the animal that ultimately ends up as Raka's namesake. The cocoon itself is a state of innocence, but growth can no longer occur within it. Instead, Raka must claw her way out and move on to form new experiences and change as a person, or now as a fresh new hibane, or charcoal feather. As we learn later, these dreams are different for every Hibane, along with the size of their cocoon and their experiences escaping from it. To be clear, the philosophy that is implied by this is merely the philosophy of the narrative, and should not necessarily be taken as my own, something that will become more important to understand moving forward. In addition, the wings which carry the look and essence of an angelic demeanor come with a price. In the latter half of the first episode, Reki helps Raka as she goes through the process of spreading her wings, something which is as awe-inspiring as it is horrific to behold, and something which carries Abe's signature style of the innocent being tainted by the dark and sinister. Eventually, Raka gets used to her wings and they become a more proper working part of her body, though I can't exactly say the same for her halo. Is this permanent? This seems to suggest that most things that are new seem painful at first, but while most are easily accustomed to, Others take significantly longer to feel natural, if they ever become natural at all. In this same vein, big changes in life often lead to changes in who we are, something that is reflected in the very first episode when Reki tells Raka that nobody knows who she used to be, and that even if her parents could see her now, they wouldn't recognize her as she is. Ultimately, these claims have no basis, but do represent the fears that can come from changing over time, including the expectation that in a state we are now, with the weight of what we've done since the last time we saw them, there's a chance that our loved ones may no longer recognize us for who we have become. Reki of all people seems the most adamant about this. As is frequently expressed, she has the most repressed emotional turmoil as a result of her past actions and regrets. In the wake of actions we feel may be wrongful, there can be a tendency to view ourselves as being separate from who we once were. This is especially clear in the case of the Hibane. I say all of this to make sense of the way Hibane are treated within the world of the show. Though the people in the town seem perfectly fine with accommodating these Hibane and allowing them positions of labor and internship, there is a clear distinction between the Hibane and the human residents of the town. A discrimination, which runs deeply, but which is ignored at the surface level in order to maintain peace between species. 
All of this seemingly occurs as a result of a seemingly mandatory obedience to the laws and customs of the toga, masked ones who rarely speak and are simultaneously feared in some capacity and respected and loved by the people of the village. Everything seems at place in the world of Hibane Renmei to form a passive-aggressive resentment towards the Hibane themselves, though as often as we viewers bear witness to this segregation, the Hibane themselves choose to accept it as a normal part of everyday life. Why use this kind of bleak world-building if not to establish the feeling that the Hibane have somehow done something wrong merely by existing? An idea which is discussed further as the series progresses, particularly through the eyes of one Hibane in particular. Raka is the youngest Hibane, not in terms of physical appearance or age, but rather in terms of how long she's been a resident of Old Home. Though this is a good way to give the audience a conduit through which to deliver exposition in a way that makes sense, given that the world of Hibane Renmei does require further analysis to create a fulfilling impact for its characters, it also allows for her to spend equal time with each of the other feathers, allowing us to get a sense for each girl's personal philosophy. Normally, I would cover all the girls, but because I believe in not quite giving everything about the series away for those who wish to rewatch it, and because Hikari has no philosophy other than she enjoys a good donut every now and again, I'll be keeping my analysis limited only to those whose impact was most important to the character of Raka herself. Sorry, Nemu, your day will come eventually. To begin with, we have Ku, or more specifically, we have Ku and her opinions on the crows, which I'd like to examine in greater detail since those opinions come as a direct contrast to the way that Kana thinks about them, but alas. I digress. Raka is a character who has a deep and thematically important connection to crows, and this comes into play when discussing how the other characters see crows, not as a representation of Raka, but instead as a bird. In the case of Ku, crows seem to be animals that are, at their core, blatantly misunderstood. The crow's feathers are dark black, and they often eat what humans would consider garbage, which leads the humans, and occasionally also the hibernae, of the town to harbor a resentment toward them, a resentment which Ku feels is completely unwarranted. Instead, Ku stands behind her belief that if humankind could communicate effectively with the crows through speech, the two species would be able to come to a mutually beneficial relationship, because all the crows really want is to sample our trash. In reality, that viewpoint is not all-inclusive, but it stands to showcase Ku as the kind of character who doesn't believe that the circumstances of one's birth should be their defining trait, which ultimately paints her as a hopeful and caring person. An optimist, for lack of a better term. Raka, a character who at this point still carries the representation of innocence, takes great pride in Ku for this comment, and their bond, which up to that point had seen them only as mild acquaintances, transforms into more of a bond which closely resembles friendship. Whether intentionally or otherwise, Ku's mindset regarding the crows also reflects one of her more internal desires. Ku was born small, but despite this, she wishes more than anything to be a role model for others, something that will later come into play. In this instance, what Ku says seems to her like the most grown-up thing to say, but it also foreshadows the feather-based conflict that serves as the basis for the series' climax, something that, again, we'll get to later. To be blunt, Ku wishes humans would take the time to care and provide for the crows, a sentiment which Kana, the Hibane who works as a clockmaker, strongly disagrees with. Get out, damn birds! While at first Kana's disdain for Corvus Corone seems uncalled for and unjustified, she explains in a moment of conversation with Raka that she feels that crows should endeavor to be more than just trash pickers, and that as the only creatures that have the ability to fly over the all-powerful and all-encompassing wall, they should act with dignity and be left to freely fly. It's Kana's belief that, in providing for the crow's needs and domesticating them, humankind would be robbing them of their freedom, that no matter how they may act or react to such treatment, the crows cannot truly be happy when their freedom to fly is inhibited. Only the freedom to be what the crows were born to be can satisfy them, for if it were different, they would cease to be crows. In saying this, Kana allows for Raka to be brought to an understanding of multiple viewpoints, but also showcases a surprising amount of character depth, which is intriguing given that the start of the series, Kana's characters seem the most immature and straightforward. In addition, Kana is also an optimist, but her optimism feels as though it's an act. Unlike Ku, who is genuine and sees the world as a flower in full bloom, or more fittingly given her later dialogue, a glass half full, Kana uses her optimism as a misplaced cover for her shortcomings. 
It's a defense mechanism, hiding the fact that deep down what Kana truly longs for is to be wanted, appreciated, and respected for her actions by her peers. This is especially apparent when Kana finally fixes the clock, only to be told to shut it off immediately. While she initially sows a hint of resentment towards Reki and the others for asking her to dismantle her greatest achievement, Kana soon relents and when Raka goes to comfort her, she is greeted not by a remorseful and emotionally distraught Kana, but instead by a girl who is grinning ear to ear, choosing to pat herself on the back for what she was able to accomplish, even if the others haven't quite noticed that accomplishment yet. When asked about this by Raka, Kana's response is quick but insightful. Rather than count it as a failure to be mourned, Kana instead chooses to count it as a success that went too well, something that she can be proud of herself for accomplishing. In this instance, this is how Kana addresses her grief, however small or insignificant that grief may seem in the moment. In truth, we may never fully understand what Kana's true feelings about the clock incident are, but we see here how she chooses to address them, at least how she does so in public. Rather than be open about her troubles, Kana employs misdirection to distract both others and herself from her problems, a tactic we will cease discussion of in relation to Kana, but which we will return to on the grounds of how it affects another character in a bit. On a completely separate note, it's Reki who ends up explaining to Raka that the crows in fact have a deeper, more involved representation among the charcoal feathers. Loss. Crows are believed by the Hibane to carry that which has been lost, and as Raka seeks to uncover what was lost within the confines of her dream in the cocoon, it is only fitting in the end that Raka has a strong connection to the shadowed feathers of the crow. I stated once before that Hibane Renmei is a show laden in grief, and that responding to that grief is, at its core, what Hibane Renmei is actually about. I also said I'd discuss what that meant in greater detail later, and as it stands, the time to discuss those subjects has come. You see, to discuss the dealings of the two headlining acts in Hibane Renmei among the subject of regret and grief, there first has to occur an event which is adequate to grieve over. That event in Hibane, the event which serves as the catalyst for the core thesis Hibane explores, is one which is grounded in the character of Ku, and more importantly, her wish. For you see, between everything else she was doing, the girl we call Ku had a plan. Inside my mind, there's a beautiful cup. A very beautiful, clear cup. And tiny drops kept falling into it. Drip, drip, drip. Slowly but steadily, every day. And today, I felt that the cup had finally become completely full. There's a moment, a little over halfway through Hibane Renmei, wherein Ku talks to Raka about the cup she sees in her heart, and how that cup has filled over time. The cup, in this case, very clearly serves as a metaphorical representation of Ku's sense of lifelong accomplishment, seeing as how her day of flight is quickly approaching her. Raka, a Hibane who knows nothing of the day of flight, or even that Hibane are capable of a form of physical death to begin with, is obviously completely oblivious to this duality in Ku's words, but being a rather kind-hearted individual expresses her appreciation for Ku's gratitude regardless. It's an ironic action considering that Raka has completely misunderstood the meaning of Ku's words, but one that kickstarts the transition for grief and self-hatred to peace and forgiveness. And then, as Ku leaves the room, Raka notices a flicker in the light of Ku's halo. Because of the way the shot is framed, this entire sequence can be chopped up to a trick of the light, which is brilliant, because that's exactly what Raka thinks it is when she first sees it, and it's this kind of expertly crafted storytelling and visual direction that works so well to open Hibane Renmei up for in-depth discussion on a large scale like this. Of course, there's also the telltale sign of giving away her personal belongings, another action of Ku's that is lost on Raka, but the most striking of these hints at Ku's fate is the conversation between Kana and Raka in the clock tower. In Kana's own words, Ku has finally given up. She gave it to you, then she finally gave up, I guess. She no longer has to pretend to be something that she isn't. This point stands parallel to her statement about the crows from earlier, but here it carries with it a tinge of grim solace and melancholy. It's clear now, to the entire audience, that Ku is going to die, or at least that she's going to disappear somehow. And while the truth of the matter is, well, the latter statement, the point still stands. Even in stating herself that Ku has given up, Kana's worldview is centered only upon herself, leaving her incapable of foreseeing what is obvious to the rest of us. Ku no longer has to pretend, because Ku no longer has the time to spend doing so. As a direct consequence for her inability to grasp what Ku had been trying to tell her, Raka's reaction to Ku's day of flight is introspective. 
Rather than seeing the day of flight as the action of a role model as Ku had intended it to be viewed as, Raka instead chooses to see this as confirmation of her own inability to be a good Hibane. Overcome by grief and stricken with the longing to see her dear friend one final time, Raka succumbs to a deep and personal depression. In reflection of this, black speckles begin appearing among the charcoal gray wings Raka had been born with, and as to be expected, Raka reacts at first with a certain degree of panic. Attempting to keep her quickly blackening feathers from being seen by the other Hibane, Raka engages in self-harm as a means of resolution to her crisis. Luckily for her, Reki is able to intervene before the damage becomes irreversible, but the sight of Raka clipping her wings is a painful one. It represents a horrific side of depression that is as important an issue as it is a tragic one. And as one with personal experience in the subject, both on the receiving end of it and knowing friends who have suffered from it, it hurts immensely to watch this happen to her, and it stands to demonstrate the severity of Raka's suffering at the hands of her own grief. Because Raka believes that the others are downplaying the severity of the loss of Ku, she grieves all the more the loss of that which she cannot reclaim. Though Reki also tries to console her, and we learn that she also has blackened wings, a condition referred to by the Hibane as being sinbound, Raka's grief continues to build. Over time, the darkness in her heart and adorning her feathers grows along with her agony, and she begins to wonder what her purpose is in life, as well as why she was born into the world of the Hibane to begin with. All of this culminates when Raka enters a clothing shop to get winter wear, only to be harassed by a woman claiming that Hibane are good luck charms, something that, given Raka's newfound understanding of the harsh realities that exist even in a place she had previously seen as paradisiacal, is highly ironic. Raka's emotional state is such that responding to even these harmless gestures of conversation is not only more than she feels emotionally capable of, but also exuberantly offensive to both her and the memory of Ku. In her mind, Raka replays the view of her tainted feathers, thankfully now covered to hide her quote-unquote sin from the world. She grasps at the feeling of inadequacy, which at least she can feel, and when the shopkeeper tries to reassure her by telling her that it's going to be okay, Raka's only responsive action is to retort that it will only get worse. Look, I don't know what happened, but things are gonna get better at some point. No, they won't. Her revelations on the sad occurrences within the world of Hibane Renmei have made that disheartening statement her only remaining truth, and with that, the only course of action left is to run from the person she has become. This is how Raka responds to grief, at least at first. But it's just at this moment that her heart, in desperation, reaches out to, and is subsequently called by, the crows. Following the call of the animal which represents her, Raka finds herself lost, and eventually, with reckless abandon and no desire left to live, Raka succumbs to the only meaning her life has left. She throws herself into a well in the forest, and places her gaze upon the truth of her dream from the beginning, as it lay before her. The truth of the dream is a dead crow. As Raka puts it, the crow in her dream represents a person she once knew, someone she knew before she was a Hibane. This is where the heart of what had been causing Raka such intense pain and loathing finally sees fit to reveal itself, and the curtain is finally pulled away. In her past life, Raka had an obsession. An obsession that was as devastatingly toxic and spiritually taxing as it was irrational. But it was hers, and hers alone. Ironically, being alone was what she had obsessed over, carrying the feeling that she was somehow unlovable. A broken mess of a human being who relied only upon her own self-wrought grief to provide her sustenance. In all of this, there was the crow, that bird which represented the one person who cared for her regardless. Someone who loved her very much, and whom she feels she had hurt through her self-neglect, or perhaps even through other means. Raka's realization in this moment of unbridled trauma and reconciliation in the well is that she had sinned against this bird, who had once been a human. And now, that crow which had kept her from the things she was yet too unstable to see could finally reveal to her its message. The message of the crow to Raka in this moment is a simple yet powerful sentiment. Rather than express disdain or rage for Raka's inability to love herself and the pain that that caused not only herself but the crow, her loved one, it instead simply chooses to forgive her. It is in being granted forgiveness that Raka's wing infection finally diminishes, and for the first time, she is truly cleansed of her sin. Her grief has been dealt with, and she is ready to accept herself. In essence, she has made peace with her dream, and discovered her true name. The crow, try as it might to save her, could not in the end protect her from herself, 
but it could offer her its forgiveness, a gift which is more precious than anything else Raka could have found at the end of her dream. Now trapped in the well with no means of escaping, Raka finally allows herself to accept the fate that she has been dealt, something that ultimately leads to her rescue at the hands of the Toga, and something which is described as inevitable by the communicator. This, in the end, is how Raka deals with grief. But Raka is not the only Sinbound. In fact, there is another. One whose approach is far more dangerous than Raka's, and one whose ultimate demise is at her own hand, or should I say feather, from the very beginning. Reki's reaction to Ku's day of flight is at first a much more poetic one. The legend goes that there are ancient ruins in the heart of the woods, and that a charcoal feather is led there on his or her day of flight. The day of flight is the time where a high bunny leaves the nest to go beyond the walls. There is no way of telling when that day will come, or to whom. He or she just disappears one day, without warning. No one knows why such things happen. A charcoal feather who is about to leave the nest never speaks of it to others. Besides, we haven't had any days of flight for the past few years, mainly because for a long time there weren't any new cocoons appearing, so nobody has left the nest for quite a while. Perhaps we were all forgetting, or hoping that we could forget, that there may come a day when we have to say goodbye to one of us, like today. In acknowledging the day of flight and moving on, Reki frees herself of the burden of remorse, which of course, we learn only a short time later is only a means to an end, seeing as how Reki's entire existence is wrought with inner turmoil. This is where we finally get a glimpse beyond Reki's wall. I would also just like to point out that it's very fitting that Reki should view the wall as she does, as an all-powerful protector that no one can ever penetrate. And I realize that this is because of her own personal experience with the wall, and maybe also with the other thing, but it serves to replicate her thoughts on her own wall and cement her isolated mindset. But this is an analogy that's neither here nor there. Reki, unlike Raka, was born in complete isolation. Her cocoon literally boarded up in an abandoned room, seemingly left to wilt away and rot. In fact, by the time Reki is finally discovered by Kuromori, the Haibane who would become her mentor and mother figure, Reki's wings have already grown in, and not as the quote-unquote beautiful charcoal gray wings that a charcoal feather should have at birth. Rather, Reki's wings are a midnight black, covered in blood and grease. Reki, of course, uses this knowledge to cement her isolation further, but in reality, not even she knows if her wings truly came that way, or if it was her loneliness and confusion that brought about the darkness in her wings. Reki believes that being born in this way is what marked her as being sin-bound, and unlike Raka's grief, which comes as a result of inflicting pain upon others, in this respect, Reki's grief is without a cure, because her pain and sorrows have always been self-inflicted. Unable to remember her dream, and without a clue to use to search for her own salvation, Reki is lost upon the world, trapped in a town that is too good for her, desperately clinging to the hope that someday she will find salvation, despite knowing deep down that that day can never come. Through time and service, Kudomori is able to aid Reki and also a young version of Nemu, like I said, your day will come eventually, Nemu, in coming to terms with her guilt. In order to hide her appearance, she uses a die from the elderly tree on the temple grounds and near the walls, something that is ultimately doing her more harm than good. In the end, Reki thinks everyone will abandon her. This is a sentiment confirmed for her when Kudomori's day of flight comes, and a disheartened Nemu blames Reki's diseased wings for it. We learn at this point also of Reki's many similarities to Raka. Both become grief-stricken and sin-bound, both to the point of indulging in self-harm as a means of coping, a method which, in both cases, and in real life, is extremely dangerous and unhealthy. But it's also at this point that the true difference between Raka and Reki shows itself. Raka's response to grief, as previously discussed, is introspective. She takes the time to look inside herself, to uncover the source of her grief and make peace with it, because the aching of her broken heart has proven itself too severe for her to bear. In doing so, Raka finds the crow, and by extension forgiveness, which is a point initially made by the communicator when Raka is initially saved. No one is truly able to provide forgiveness for themselves because this is only a half-hearted measure for coping with that grief in the first place. Instead, it is only when those we have hurt forgive us, when we receive forgiveness and are given back our self-worth by the kindness of another, that we can truly heal. This is the philosophy of Haibane Renmei, the leader of the Toga and for whom the communicator speaks. As Reki has only hurt herself, she is unable to attain this peace, and her sin-bound wings grow darker and darker under the weight of her crushing self-deprecation. For Reki, this is inescapable. 
and therefore her reaction is based on looking outside of herself. To cast her stones upon the back of another, be it God or someone else, because she was born under circumstances that prevented her from experiencing joy from the very beginning. It was this clouded mindset in the end that allowed her to become what she was born to be, what the Black Wings foretold she would someday evolve into, one who is bound by the weight of sin. And for Reki, the cycle of sin has no escape in sight. In the end, she must surely be left alone. In the end, it seems to her, everyone will abandon her, just like Kuromori. This kind of emotional torment, which is so haunting to her, is what drags Reki into the self-destructive behaviors and trauma-riddled state that we find her in at the series' conclusion. Having painted a picture of her own destruction, having orchestrated it herself, Reki resides to her fate as one who will never be happy. Inside, the innocent child she once was begs for her to ask for help, something which Reki is apparently too stubborn, or more accurately, too afraid to do. As expressed by the communicator, only others can provide forgiveness to us, and because Reki is the one who has been hurt, and it was by her very hand that she had done so, she remains sin-bound. Unable to gain forgiveness because there is no one left to comfort her. She had tried to find ways to attain salvation of her own accord, first by plot and then by personality, opting to try and help others surround her to gain the favor of God and obtain forgiveness, but in the end these efforts were fruitless, and as Reki awaits her own destruction, the child inside her finally dies, and Reki is truly alone. A train barrels toward her, her final painting gaining the power to overtake its own artist. It will kill her, or so she believes, finally allowing the pain to end. Outside, Raka begs Reki to ask her for help, for only she, another Hibone, can provide Reki with forgiveness, but Reki misunderstands the meaning of Raka's gestures, instead focusing on herself and her own agony. This is how Reki responds to her grief, by placing the burden squarely upon her own shoulders and allowing her agony to overtake her. What happened to Reki was inevitable, or so one might say. Her very wings predicted its occurrence. However, Wings are not gods. They have no power to govern over agency or decision-making in the lives of whom they exist. What color one's wings are ultimately proves very little, as even the darkest feathers can be returned to a beautiful charcoal gray by the power of the others around us. Their forgiveness is what makes us whole. This is the meaning of the riddle presented by the communicator, a riddle he gives to both Reki and Raka, and for both of whom the final answer remains the same. It's okay to call out for help. You are not alone in your burdens, and you needn't force yourself to be. There are those that care for you, and who wish only for you to be able to spread your wings with confidence. In the end, none of us are truly capable of flight, but that does not mean that we must be complacent in our shortcomings, or blame ourselves for them. Instead, we must look to those we've hurt, or who have hurt us, and seek to provide or be provided for in search of that great relief which is forgiveness. This is how Haibane Renmei expresses we should approach grief. This is how the show gives an insight on dealing with grief. And religious though it may appear, its ability to communicate that with its audience is what makes it so special to watch. In the end, all one must do to seek help is to ask for it. That is the true meaning of Haibane Renmei. And in the end, that is what Reki must finally come to understand. Should a bird in the form of a crow endeavor to save her, her true name would be altered, and she will become a stepping stone, that Reki, which is not torn asunder, but which guides the weak on their journey home. Of course, that is not certain. It can only come if she overcomes herself and chooses to ask for it. That is a decision that she can only make for herself. And in the end, standing amid the pit of despair, the train of emptiness which would swallow her whole, Reki's final response to her ultimate inner turmoil is this. Raka. Please help me. Okay, well, that got a little more uh, deep than I expected. Anyway, that was a super long one, and I'm really grateful to those that stuck with it all the way through. I, I know it probably wasn't as good as it sounded in my head as I worked on it, but I'm glad for your support either way. I plan on doing a lot more big analysis projects like this in the future, but I'm not really sure when those will come out or what they'll be on, so you'll have to bear with me on that front. 
Anyways, as should become the norm from now on, you can see more Octo content by clicking right here. This is a video I did on Alien 9, which is more in the vein of upbeat, humorous content, even though it isn't funny and has horrible audio, it's, uh, it's something alright. And, and over here, you can click to be taken on another one of my Deep Dive episodes, where I discuss something else in way too much detail for no reason. At the time of me writing this, there really isn't anything else I've done a Deep Dive on yet, but I like to plan ahead, so if during editing I decide what goes here, then it should go here. Wink wink. And anyway, that's all for today. Links in the description for other content on this channel, as well as a link taking you to Funimation's broken website, where you can watch Hibernate Renme legally online, in case this video made you want to see it again. I'm Octo, and hey, thanks for joining me down here, in my tiny corner of the internet. See you next time.